Hello everyone, welcome back to another one of our Through the Bible studies. Today we're going to be summarizing the Acts of the Apostles. For those of you who are just joining us, going beyond the Gospels and into this historical section, my goal here is not to substitute personal Bible study for you, but rather to give you an overview of what to expect when, not if, but when you read this on your own time. Of course, we're going to lay down the information you're going to need to know in not only understanding for yourself, but also being able to explain to other people why we believe this book is not a collection of fables, but actually a collection of facts and history. Because of the overwhelming amount of non-fictional characters, like Emperor Nero, like the governors Felix and Agrippa, like the dates that we can set around this. During the reign of Cornelius, this happened. During the reign of Agrippa as governor of Caesarea, this happened. All, all, or Felix of Caesarea, this happened. All of these things are centered around real people that we know existed in real time. Real places are cited, not fictional ones. Real events are cited, not fictional ones. And all this stuff that we can verify archaeologically is essentially showing the individual who's reading this where their priorities are. Either I assume this book is false before I read it and I look for ways to confirm that, or I am assuming this book is true and then looking for ways to confirm that. Now tell me which is objective. Because if I'm looking for this to be true and I find no reason, then I conclude I'm wrong. If I decide this book is wrong and look for ways to confirm that, it's gonna be wrong no matter what because I'm going to be looking at this in a way that isn't objective. My goal here is to speak out to the objective audience that wants to know why we believe that this book is a fact of history. And I'll start with the basics. Who wrote the Acts of the Apostles? Well, the book of Acts is actually a sequel to the Gospel according to Luke, which was written by, you guessed it, the Luke of the Gospel according to Luke, the physician. This is a record of history according to his own account because the first opening verses of this essentially put that in order. Inasmuch as I have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of those of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed." Luke lays down with the same language and with the same intention as the Gospel of Luke with the authority of ultimately recording the things that not only he saw, but that the ones who saw it saw. He interviews the eyewitnesses because understand this book, it was completed, best guess, around 60 AD. Some would say as late as 68, 69, but the keen understanding that is because historically we know when Jerusalem, the temple especially, was destroyed by the Romans. This book addresses everything historically before that took place, but not after. And given how horrifying an event that would have been, not only for the early church, but for the Christians, it would have been recorded if it had already happened. And because of its absence, I'm not saying, well, that proves that it's false, because I assume it has to be written after the fact, but only talks about events in a ways before it. There's two ways of going at that. I could either say, hmm, so either this book was written before those things, or it was written after if I assume that they would have left out those huge details. I don't assume those things because that's unreasonable. It's possible, but it's unreasonable. And so we want to come to sound conclusions on these sort of matters. And with that conclusion, then, the history covered goes from the immediate let leaving off point of the Gospel of Luke, which would have been 33, 34 AD, and goes all the way to 59 AD. Now, some would date longer, but it's really irrelevant by one or two years, not because of the history, but because of the calendar. So, once again, where did this all take place? A lot of places. We follow the not only ascension of Jesus and the founding of the early church in Jerusalem, so narrow that down, but then the sharing of the gospel and growth of the church goes from Jerusalem itself to Israel to the northern regions of Galilee, to Samaria, which is in the far northern regions, and as well Syria, 
Asia Minor, which we would call modern-day Turkey, into Greece, and ultimately concluding in Rome, the ends of the earth as they knew it in those days. Likewise, this isn't recorded in Acts, but we know that according to history, the apostles like Thomas went to India, others like Bartholomew, I believe, went to Central Africa, and several others went to Spain as well. We have a large, large coverage of ground as far as this 30-year record of history. And it's also important to note that this is 30 years of history recorded, more or less. And the grand total number of miracles, which is the hot button issue that causes most to just reject this off the bat, not because the evidence suggests it, but their worldview demands it. They would put them around 18 miracles, as far as direct sighting of a miraculous event. Now think about that, 30 years, 18 miracles, that's an average of maybe one to two a year, which sounds about the same as they're happening in the church in our world today. So. Think about this. Are miracles more or less frequent than during the time in which the Holy Spirit was working through the apostles? Because you hear people saying that. Oh, I just wish we could go back to the days where God was working and the church and miracles were happening and all this other stuff. Now, miracles barely happen like once a year or so. Well, that actually pretty much checks out the same way it did in the early church. And that's also important to clarify, too, because you have to ask why these miracles occurred. We can clarify if they occurred in a moment, but why did they occur? Why do miracles take place? Why do we see them so rarely? Otherwise, they wouldn't be called miracles, they'd be called events. Well, the very nature of a miracle, when they say, oh, it can't have happened because it doesn't happen a lot. Well, that's by that logic, then you were never born because you, as a human being, were only born once in all of human history. Human beings were born, granted, I acknowledge that, but understand, you as a human being have only been born once. That's a very rare event, wouldn't you say? In fact, probably the rarest event of only, something only ever happens in that exact way once in the history of mankind by the logic of naturalists that would deny miracles based on those assumptions. I believe it was David Hume who made that theory because it's improbable, because a wise man focuses on the things that happen more often than less than a wise man can't believe in miracles. Well, think about that. I was only born once in the history of ever in mankind, so philosophically then I must have never been born because a wise man doesn't believe in things that only happen so often. But the point being made is this. 18 miracles, 30 years. Sounds about right. Why do miracles then happen? Well, understand that every single time, Old or New Testament, whenever miracles are recorded, what was happening at the same time? God was speaking. And when he spoke, people could just take his word for it. But as we're going to read, as was the case for the church in Berea, which is in Greece, in case you were wondering, they when they heard Paul and Silas, the Apostle Paul, writer of a third of the New Testament, said, hey, here's the gospel. This is what's been fulfilled. Here's what the Old Testament says about this. These are the prophets. Check this out. What do you think? They said, let's double check. Does it actually say that? Are you really telling us the truth? And they said, hey, thumbs up. Now, if they had to double check what Paul the Apostle was telling them, and the Bible gave them double thumbs up, then you should be, like, including toes into the mix as far as thumbs up when checking out what I am telling you, especially if these are summaries. Do your homework. Don't take my word for it. And don't take anyone else's word for it either. Have reason to believe these things. Check it out. And when we're talking about all these things, again, every time in the Old Testament, New Testament, whatever, a miracle always correlated with when God was speaking. Why? Because... It was God putting his money where his mouth was. Here is God speaking. Prove it. Glad to. Watch this. God introducing new factors into nature in order to confirm new words about him that are being said. It's one of the four standards of a prophet, remember? Firstly, they had to be direct eyewitnesses or from the eyewitnesses that saw this. You can't just say that someone told you who was friend of a former roommate who worked with and all this other different stuff of the guy, because that way the accountability isn't on them, it's on you. 
And you may be wrong, but it doesn't change the fact that they may be right. They needed direct access to the eyewitnesses or to be the eyewitness themselves. Always the case for the Old Testament. Only exception in Luke and in Acts, but understand as well, that was the whole point. He was taking this from the eyewitnesses themselves, of which were still alive at his lifetime. You can't make a legend, according to ancient history, until a minimum of 300 years have passed. Some would say two, but the point remains. If the original people who were around, say you make a legend about me, and you say, okay, uh, Shady Oak, he was, you know, seven feet tall, and his voice was large and booming, and, you know, thousands of people got saved every time he spoke. Well, if you spoke that while I was still around, firstly, they could look at this channel and see I'm tall, but not that tall. Secondly, you could look at the subscriber count and say, yeah, that guy's pretty much speaking to a niche audience, not thousands of people, not even a thousand people for that matter. And then thirdly, you can say, okay, I'm listening to his voice, especially in his early studies when he was trying to figure out the sound system, I could barely hear him. That sounds hardly booming. So you could hardly form a legend off of Shady Oak within his lifetime. Why? Because people can go and check it out. What about after I'm dead? Could you make up stuff about me the moment that I pass from the world scene? Not necessarily, because note, there are people who still know me, and people who knew those who knew me, and people who knew about me, and would be able to call you out on that, and would be more credible than the person just making up the stuff, especially in the internet world we live in today, that would still have access to these clips. So then, beyond the lifetime of me, my witnesses and the people who knew them. You can't make this stuff up that fast. And since this information is taken directly after the ascension of Jesus and within the lifetimes of the original eyewitnesses, this material would either have been thrown out by the early church because they have all the original eyewitnesses there, or maybe Luke's just telling the truth. He's recording history as he sees it. As these miracles are recorded, and as long as your worldview doesn't get in the way of being objective, the historical context of this is going to pick up right where Luke left off. And understand as well, Luke wouldn't step in as far as interacting with the world scene directly until after Paul's second missionary journey at the earliest. We'll get to that in our study today. But this is essentially what he's laying out. All the accounts are from the eyewitnesses, and he is able to interview multiple ones. And according to qualified archaeologists and historians like Sir Gordon Ramsay, they would note Luke as a historian of the first rank. So when we're talking about this information, it's not only geared towards a non-Jewish audience from a historian's perspective and cross-examined by even modern historians and saying this guy knew how to make a case. This guy knew what information to look for, what we'd need to confirm whether this was true or not. So, with that in mind, there will be eight events that we're going to discuss today in summarizing the Acts of the Apostles, and I'll try not to take up too much of your time because I want you to get to reading it on your own. Starting, of course, with the Ascension, Jesus promises his disciples that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was coming and to wait for it as well as to share the gospel with as many as they could before his return, the time of which they were not told. Now that's something worth mentioning because there's often that objection, if Jesus was God, how did he not know the day or the hour of his return? He said the Son of Man doesn't know, the angels doesn't know, only the Father in heaven knows. But then we see in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he instead of saying, oh, I don't know, he says, it has not been given to you. Oh, verse 7, I apologize. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And then he ascends into heaven in their sight from the Mount of Olives. And according to Zechariah, if you remember... Where is Jesus going to return? Where are his feet going to land when he returns in Revelation 19? That's why the angel said, just as you saw him go, you also see him return. He told you to share the gospel, so get to him. That, that, that's fun. Anyway, so our mission, our goal, the Great Commission, is to share the gospel with as many and as any who are willing to hear it. And note, 
by Jesus' own standard, there's going to be a lot of people receiving the seed of the gospel, but not a lot of ground, not a lot of soil it's going to be planted in. And if you have one out of four, according to Jesus, that's a perfect record. So understand, unfortunately, people oftentimes have made up their mind long before they have a chance to actually look at the information, but there are still people who will listen, so don't be discouraged. And that's where we see Pentecost coming in. Penta, like a pentagon, it means five. In this reference, it was 50 days after the second Jewish festival. What were the first two? Well, the first Jewish festival, following the new year, of course, we'll count that as last, is Passover. Now, if you remember our study in Exodus, that was celebrating the time where God moved in power in Israel's history by not only judging the king of Egypt, by rejecting his opportunity to obey God and let the people of Israel worship God for a weekend. And after 10 legit miracles, plagues covering the land of Egypt, directly after Aaron and Moses warned him this would happen if he refused God's authority, he rejected God 10 times. And this 10th would be a doozy. All the firstborn children, very important in that ancient culture, members of the family, they would die. God would be the one to take their lives because he was the one who originally gave it to them. And as you know, we aren't assuming the atheist definition of death. We're believing in the theistic God, right? And God, when he kills somebody, what happens to them? Are they destroyed or do they just change locations from here to him? He has that right. But understand this as well. When these firstborn were going to be killed, this didn't include, disclude rather the Hebrews. God told them, in order to benefit from my protection, you have to do something. Take a lamb, a perfect lamb, inspect it for any sort of blemish for a full week, and then on the fifth day, sacrifice it as an offering for your sins. Then take its blood, mark it on the door, and eat the lamb. And that would be the last decent meal they would have because they'd be leaving and heading out the next day. But catch that. The lamb would be sacrificed for their sins to spare them from God's wrath on the entire land of Egypt, the world, right? I wonder what that was referencing. The cross, perhaps? The spotless lamb being sacrificed? That had already been fulfilled. Then the second Jewish festival was three days. You probably see where I'm already going with this. Three days after Passover. It's called the Feast of First Fruits, where they would start to see the crops growing and the earliest and best of the plants, they would gather together and offer to God as a thanks for what he had given and looking forward to what else they had coming next in the harvest. Now think about that. What happened three days after the crucifixion? Jesus' resurrection. He was the first fruit, the first to benefit from his sacrifice, the rising from the dead and giving that eternal glorious body, something that we all will have very soon when we ultimately leave this world scene. And he was the first one to prove it, that it worked. So first fruits, Passover, already fulfilled. What about the third, Pentecost? Well, 50 days after, they were going to the Jewish festival, just like any of the other Jews in the nation would have, and they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism, we usually think of water when we hear that, but the word literally means immersion. They were immersed in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, in case you were wondering, isn't water. It's the third person of the Trinity. You're immersed in God's Spirit, but you're thinking, wait, Aren't we indwelt by the Holy Spirit the moment that we are saved? God enters into our hearts and seals us, keeps us from sin, even though we still struggle with sin as Christians, that God keeps us right in his eyes because of what Jesus did for us? Yes. But understand, a Christian receiving the Holy Spirit and being filled and used by the Holy Spirit are two different things. We have the opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit, that salvation, but you also have the daily opportunity to be used by the Holy Spirit, to be filled and let God live out his character, his heart, his life through you. And that's a daily choice for a Christian. That's the Christian life. Daily saying, God, fill me with your spirit. Let me live my life the way you want me to. Live my life, (laughs) or you live your life through me. And that's what I ultimately want. Well, that's what the disciples experienced. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And along with some very, very dramatic announcements that this was the case, 
the disciples began speaking in tongues. Once again, very controversial. Does that mean they just started spouting off nonsense? You know, saying banana, apple, orange, paraquat, all this other different stuff, or like the Toronto blessing, do they start barking like dogs and uh, clucking like chickens and stuff? It's like, oh, it's the Holy Spirit, it's a work of God. No. The gift of tongues is speaking in a language you don't know, but everyone else does. 1 Corinthians 14 through, or 12 through 14, rather, go through this in detail. But as far as the spiritual gift, like every miracle, it's for the purpose of affirming God is working, not just to make you look like an idiot, make you feel important by doing something stupid and calling it from God. Now note, just because people abuse the gift of tongues, it doesn't mean that it's no longer something I want anything to do with. We've seen legitimate cases of it happening. But also understand when someone pretends that God is doing something, they're either deceived, they think that's what tongues is and their emotions are getting the best of them, or they're deceiving. They know that this isn't tongues, but they're looking for attention. Either way, we need to go off of this biblically. And the way the apostles, the disciples, this large group, were speaking in tongues was for the purpose of talking to all the people gathered from all over the world, all the Jews gathered for this festival throughout the Roman Empire, were speaking in their own languages and dialects and hearing, even though they spoke Aramaic and Hebrew, they would have been able to understand in their own language the things that God had done within the last two months. And here's what's interesting. This got their attention for sure. But that is where Peter then stood up and filled with the Holy Spirit. Key detail here. You're going to hear this a lot in the book and hopefully be practicing it a lot in your own lives as well. Peter then gives the first sermon filled with the Holy Spirit. Another gift, prophecy. Not talking about the future, but speaking as a spokesman for God. That's what I'm attempting to do here to equip you with the edification, exhortation, and comfort necessary to not only engage with the Acts of the Apostles and see what God has done in church history, inspired by His Spirit, but also encourage you and enable you to live life the way God wants you to, through His Word. And as Peter was preaching this message, it was no more Spirit-filled than the tongues, than the people who were receiving salvation, through anything else. It was all the same deal, and that's what we're getting to experience here and now hope that the Spirit's speaking to you. But with that in mind, 5,000 people end up giving their lives to Jesus. How does that correlate with the Feast of Pentecost? Because as we recall, Passover, there's a definite correlation between the Passover lamb and Jesus offering his life on the cross, his blood saving us from death, right? Likewise, the Feast of First Fruits, the resurrection, something we'll all benefit from soon, but that Jesus benefited from first as a demonstration of what was to come. What about Pentecost? Well, after the crops start growing and first fruits, what happens? Well, the rest of the crops still need to grow in. And at Pentecost, 50 days will have passed after that. So you're thinking, okay, two months is a lot of time for the buds to have sprouted and start producing fruit. So it would be basically the first major harvest, but not the last before winter, right? Because you still got a couple more weeks before harvest officially ends and it becomes winter again. Well, Pentecost was essentially that point. The Christians, followers of Christ, we'll, we'll get to where that word came from here in a moment, but the people who were following Jesus, the followers of the way they called themselves, they had come to a relationship with God, but they were by no means a bountiful harvest, a few hundred, maybe a thousand at most. But here's the other interesting thing. When Peter gave this sermon, and the majority of which, by the way, were the crowd that had told Pilate, crucify him, his blood be on us and our children, the same crowd that Jesus had spoken to from the cross and said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, that prayer was answered here when 5,000 people gave their lives to God by not only believing who he said he was, but what he did, that it was for them. That's all that's required for you to become a Christian, to be saved. Believe in whom the Father has sent, what he ultimately sent him to do, and that was to die on behalf of your sins so that you could be with him forever. If you believe that he was God and that God has risen him from the dead, 
being God and all, and has ultimately redeemed you to him. That's it. That's all that's necessary. You don't have to attend a specific church. You don't have to go through a specific prayer. It helps to say those things because those are the basics of what a Christian needs to believe. Saying it out loud kind of affirms that. We'll get into other passages that reiterate that point as well. But getting back to the main point being talked in, we're talking about here, I'm, I'm going on. I get excited. You can't help it. I love this book. Anyway, 5,000 people now come to a relationship with God. But remember, the majority of the Jewish nation, still in the millions, right? Was that the kind of environment where Christians were welcome? Where Christ was welcome? Let's just ask that point. No, they weren't. And in fact, the majority of the people, just like today, Orthodox Jewish families, if they find out that one of their Jewish kids has come to a relationship with their Messiah, Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew, they'll treat them as having fallen for a false prophet, host a funeral for them, and cast them out. And that's a really serious thing if you know how close-knit most Jewish families are having to experience that from those that they grew up with or raised with and who they love it really sets the priority in order that's why when jesus said unless you hate your father and mother not as an emotion like disdaining them but a priority of relationships love less love in the english language that would be the best equivalent that is our priority because families will be divided over this and the five thousand christians now followers of Jesus, the Jews that had come to know their Messiah because of the Holy Spirit, they're now in Jerusalem away from their homes. Some of them have jobs, some of them don't. None of them have homes anymore to go back to because the majority of them didn't even live in Jerusalem. It wasn't nearly as big a city as we have it today and it can hardly accommodate so many people. But we're talking about this and these 5,000 people have nowhere else to go. And this is where the church starts. Because understand this, this is essentially where we get the word church from. It's not a building. You could be anywhere and be in church because what church is, is a gathering of like-minded people. And while these people have nowhere to go and most of them don't have any way of making money, the women who would be looked down upon in that culture and just required to be cared for by their husbands, they couldn't provide for themselves. And so those within the church, they didn't marry them. They didn't take advantage of their negative situation. They, like we do in the church today, voluntarily shared. Now you'd say, oh, is this like a political financial plan that God ordains, like, you know, Christ communism? No, it has nothing to do with that. These people had their hearts changed by God. And out of a love for their fellow family members, family and God, their brothers and sisters in Christ, they were willing to treat each other as family. Now, understand, the government can try and mimic that and say, by force and threat of prison, you will treat everyone like your family. But in Christianity, it's the exact opposite way around. They don't have to force anyone to do anything. Their hearts wanted to do this, and they only did it for so long. Because these people would eventually then have to find jobs. They would eventually then have the opportunity to seek out relationships and be provided for. But as far as where they were at now, God took care of them and used each other. And that desire to help each other that God put into their hearts, notice that wasn't there at the beginning. Because if we're honest, we put ourselves before anything else. Even if we act selfless, it's ultimately to make ourselves better than we honestly are. But this is the point that we ultimately need to come back to. Everyone is now a part of this church, this gathering of like-minded and like-hearted people. And by supporting each other this way, this was the first church, this first community of believers that were supporting each other spiritually and financially. But unfortunately, like all human beings, we still have a lot of growing up to do. And you're going to see this is a very common theme throughout the Acts of the Apostles. Culture, race, religion, all these things, well, not religion, obviously, but these dividing factors still played a role. Because understand, in first century Israel, the Jewish thought towards a non-Jew was that they were only created by God to be kindling for the fire of hell. They were 
completely unless they converted and became Jewish. They were circumcised and all that other different stuff. Ask me what that means if you don't know. I won't hear. But the point that's being made in all of this is that... What is the point I was making in all of this? Lost my train of thought. Anyway, the, the financial crisis, right? The, the issue between the races and the people with different backgrounds, they were all Jewish, but some were ethnically pure blood Jews and others were Hellenistic Jews. They were from Greek families that had Jewish relatives and thus they would consider themselves Jewish. Well, the people who were distributing the money that everyone needed to survive, they said, well, the pure Jews, they're the ones who get first dibs and then we'll get to you later. Well, the apostles who have better things to do than sort out these sort of racist squabbles said, look, God's called us to share the gospel and we have to get our testimony out there. We don't have time to serve tables. So here's what we're going to do. There's us with our calling. We're going to raise up deacons, which is a word that just literally means servants, and they're going to serve you. They'll be ministers. That's what the word means. Again, servants. And they're going to take care of your needs. They'll sort out all the counseling and financial squabbles and anything else that you guys need. And the seven people that were raised up, the first two, by the way, take note of their names because they're going to become pretty important here really quick. Stephen, Philip, then Procurus, Nacanor, Timon, Parnemius, Nicholas, I don't know if I'm pronouncing them right, but these were the individuals that were raised up by the apostles to fulfill that role in church. So we see different roles, but ultimately the same goal and function within the body. And as these apostles are out sharing the gospel, the deacons are ministering to the flock within the church. And I say flock because the word pastor also means shepherd, so that's where that term comes from, taking care of God's people, even if they are comparable to dumb animals. But anyway, anyway, so Stephen, Philip, and these other guys, Stephen was being used by God in a very powerful way, and naturally it attracted attention, both positive and negative. And interestingly enough, like what we're attempting to do here, he simply answered questions and asked people some of his own. And when they couldn't answer those questions and couldn't deny the answers that he was giving, they brought him before their high priest. Yes, that high priest. And said, well, this is our best mind, the most famous of our, you know, Christianity debunkers, and he's going to squash you. Well, Stephen, seeing a very juicy opportunity here, said, okay, I'm talking to Orthodox traditional practice Jews. Hey, let's talk about Abraham. You're the founder of the Jewish nation, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Let, let's talk about your greatest king, King David. Let, let's talk about all the times that God's spoken throughout the prophets in history. And they're like, oh yeah, sure. I, uh, in order to be a Pharisee, of which the high priest was usually nominated, he, he would have, have to have been a Levite as well. But, oh yeah, I have the Old Testament memorized. Go ahead. And he's saying, you know, as I recall, when Abraham was speaking, did the people respond well? His family, did they support him? How about, you know, just, just a thought here, how about Moses, founder of the law, right? Writer of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, you remember him? Oh yeah, we, we follow Moses, yeah. Oh, um, what happened in the book of Numbers where every, actually Exodus 2, where every single time that God was legitimately doing something, and you'd acknowledge that, right? Oh yes, God was working through Moses and Aaron. Why'd the nation reject him? Rebellion, entering into the promised land, wandering in the desert for 40 years, the rebellion of Korah, fights with the fire serpents and all these other different things. Was there, I mean, David, the, the anointed king of Israel, right? God chose him as a man after his own heart. Yes, he was the anointed king. Um, okay, uh, why was he kicked out by the country, first with King Saul and second by Absalom, his son? You know, come to think of it, when wasn't there a time in history where God did a legitimate work through the prophets, through his messengers, through his people, that you didn't want to then kill them? Now, we think that the SJW snowflake, if I can't respond with reason, I'll respond with emotion concept is something new for the internet because people can hide behind things. It's not. Those kinds of 
people. I'll acknowledge them as that much. These kind of people have always been around. And sometimes they just had more backbone than we gave them credit for. And here, here they obviously couldn't respond to that. They're like, okay, I could either A, make the association between our response to Jesus and acknowledge, yes, we did reject the Messiah, just like all of our ancestors rejected the prophets and the messengers. Or I could just kill you. And that's what they did. Stephen was essentially the first drop of blood that set off the spark of persecution against the Christians and saying, we can't answer those questions. Listen up, because they actually know what they believe. Ask questions if you don't. That's what we're here for. But on top of that, Stephen, the first one to give his life, Follow the example of Jesus by before leaving his last breath, or breathing his last breath, he left this message. Father, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And then he died. So it uses the term fell asleep. Well, here's the thing. This set off a huge keg barrel. And this essentially set the standard for treatment of Christians across the Jewish state, the Jerusalem especially, where the church started. So the Christians are then either staying and in hiding, sharing the gospel where they can, or they're leaving Jerusalem and sharing the gospel wherever they can. Hmm. Thinks following Jesus's orders to Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria, then to the end, oh, hello, and then to the ends of the earth. You see how this is working out? Well, and by the way, not by violence either. Violence, yes, but done onto them. So this first martyr by SJW Antifa crowd riots then ultimately brings on the world scene a man by the name of Saul. Saul, who was born of Tarsus, but was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a full-blood Jew and was a scholar among scholars. He was a member of the Pharisees, who, by the way, if you remember... He, they would have had to have required to have been to have memorized the entire Old Testament and the commentaries by the rabbis on the entire Old Testament and the commentaries on the commentaries, literally shelves of books they would all know by memory. I mean, I'm, I'm having trouble with those back there, but we're, we're talking about this and we're talking about a scholar among scholars. We even have verified reports from not just Christian, but non-Christian sources like Josephus that said Paul studied under Gamaliel. Like think Master Yoda to Star Wars was Gamaliel historically in Judaism. And the only reports we have from Gamaliel written about the Apostle Paul was, I couldn't keep that kid in enough books. This guy knew his stuff and he was so passionate from the most elite and rigorous moral standards and the most well-read scholars of Judaism. And he looked at this group of people who claimed to be following this man who said he was the Messiah, which was just as common then as it is today. I mean, you think like, you know, I think Peter in Family Guy uh, you know, static electricity is like, oh my gosh, I'm Jesus. You go to any insane asylum, you'll see plenty of people claiming to be God. And likewise, that's how Paul viewed Jesus, just one more false prophet. And then he found out this cause is growing, and he's like, not in my Judaism. I'm going to go out of my way to hunt down and imprison these people and force them to convert back. And he went to so far as to hunt down and kill Christians in Jerusalem. He wreaked havoc of the church. Meanwhile, Philip, yes, that Philip, continues to share the gospel where and when he could. A man by the name of Simon, who was a sorcerer, a practicer of magic, it didn't, had nothing to do with demons. It was just sleight of hand, tricks and that sort of stuff. And 99.99% .99 of the time, it has nothing to do with demons. It's just sharing their message. You can do one or two things with magic. You can deceive to entertain, or you can deceive with a message which is deceptive, right? And, you know, doing the card tricks and stuff, I, I've seen people do this at college campuses, it had nothing to do with demons. But on the other hand, if you have someone who's doing magic tricks on college campuses, or, for example, real life in Africa and in Indonesia and in Asia, you're talking about these things and they say, this proves, see, that I am an avatar. I am, I'm a god. 
you know, Dalai Lama, he would conjure up coins from thin air, he used sleight of hand tricks, obviously, but he'd say, see, I'm an avatar of the Hindu gods, and, well, you understand the point that's being made here. Simon, who was formerly from that kind of background, in Samaria, by the way, so they're beyond Jerusalem, he comes to a relationship with God. He hears them preaching. He believes in what they're saying. But then he sees all of the miracles God's doing to back up what they're saying so that their faith is based on fact, not feelings about what was said. And he looks at that and he's like, man, I've, I've done like, you know, psychosemantic surgery and all that. I've made people think they were better, but that bone's setting itself again. I've never seen that before. A leprosy, you don't get better from that. How are they doing that? And then he comes up to the apostles and he says, Hey, um, here's some money. Can you teach me those tricks? I want to do that too. Because that's how he learned his other tricks, right? And they say, Hey, your money perish wish with you. This isn't entertainment. This isn't a trick. This is God working through us. And if you think God is just here to trick people, you are on the wrong track spiritually, my friend. And Simon said, Oh, Boy, I, you're right. I got to get my act in order. Well, this is where the term seminist came from. Someone who buys their way into a position of church leadership instead of being called by God to it. And that played a big role in history, especially during the Dark Ages. Pretty much every role was accomplished that way at that point. But there's the point that's being made in all of this. Simon is called out on his nonsense. And likewise, Philip, he gets a sideways rapture experience. Go ahead and read it in your own time. But he's taken up, he's snatched up. That's what the word rapture means, by the way. Rapturos, which is Latin for haparzo in Greek, to snatch. He was taken, essentially teleported, to a place where in the Philistine regions, a treasurer, the treasurer, actually, of Ethiopia, which we would know as this small country on the north or yeah, kind of the central eastern side of Africa. But back then, it was basically just Africa that wasn't Rome. And uh, the Ethiopians, their king thought he was God. So this is just a sidetrack, but obviously he's too holy, mighty, and majestic to handle small details like managing his country. And so the queen had to do everything. And when she obviously could only take so much, she was the one who had all of the hired hands. You had the treasurers, the generals, they all reported to the queen because the king couldn't be bothered, except for the queen, which I won't tell you why. But the point is, this treasurer was essentially the most influential guy in all of Africa because he had direct access to the queen and the queen was the one who managed everything because the king was a fat loser. But um, <laughs> let's be honest here, folks. And this treasurer wanted to visit the Jewish temple, but unfortunately, because he wasn't Jewish, he had to, you know, just leave with a souvenir. He got a scroll of the book of Isaiah, and he's like trying to make sense out of it because he doesn't understand the history and stuff. And he got to the part, and I, plenty of places actually, but he gets to the part about Jesus, one of them, and Philip notices that and he sees this big armor detachment with all the guards and soldiers remember big vip here right and he says hey do you know what you're reading it's like no i i need someone to help me with this he's like i i know what that's talking about well guards stand down come on up tell me and so he philip points out to him and he says that's talking about the messiah well, who's that oh the word is anointed one the chosen one the one that god said through his other prophets as well as through this prophet that you're reading he would be the one to restore mankind's relationship with God. He would make us right with God again. He'd be our guarantee to heaven. And he proved it not only through miracles and signs, but through rising himself from the dead. And this happened within our lifetimes. And the Ethiopian's like, well, I'm in. <laughs> I'll become a Christian. He's like, just believe and be baptized. And he said, there's water right there. Let's do it. And so the Ethiopian treasurer the most influential man in all of Africa, as it was known, becomes a Christian, goes back to his country, and then God says, your work's done, Philip, and he takes him and puts him back where he started. He says, keep sharing. That's very interesting. So while Paul's trying to dismantle the church, it's obviously not working because those who took their relationship with God seriously aren't being stopped. Persecution always helps the church thrive. It just kind of limits 
the influence and reach were supposed to remain low and widespread. That's why we were compared to mustard seed, but were described as being like a tree. That's not normal. So stay low, stay faithful, stay consistent. Just share the faith with where you're at and with what you can. And with all this in mind, Saul's efforts are not being impeded, or rather they are being impeded, but he's not impeding God. And now this is where things get funny, because Saul's looking at this, and he's persecuting the Christians in Jerusalem. But then he's like, great, we scared all of the active Christians out of Jerusalem. Now they're going to Syria and to Judea and all the and Galilee and all these other different places. And then he goes to the Pharisees, and he says, hey, can you guys get me some permission, some letters that'll help me rally up our troops outside of Israel so that we can eliminate this sect before it gets any bigger. And they said, absolutely. Here, go to Damascus, the capital of Syria. Take this letter to the Jews there. They'll help you in prison and bring those Jews back here, and then we can end this once and for all. Well, on the way, Paul, or Saul, he's not Paul yet, Saul encounters Jesus in full glory. Blinded by the experience, and note the group also encounters it as well, they, <laughs> well, let's just say this, Paul understands what Jesus is saying. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he could put two and two together. He's like, okay, shining glory, blinding light, this kind of voice. God, <laughs> who are you, Lord, that I may serve you? And he's saying, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Uh-oh. <laughs> now remember, Paul is willing to kill for his faith. He genuinely believes it. But the moment he finds out firsthand that he's barking up the wrong tree spiritually, he goes, I was wrong. I am in trouble. <laughs> but Jesus says, go to Damascus, meet this guy, his name would be Ananias, and he would also be let in on this because he knew who Saul was. And he meets him, prays for him, cures his blindness that he received from the experience and seeing Jesus in full glory. And then Saul becomes Paul. He becomes a Christian. And ironically enough, he starts preaching the gospel that he had formerly denied. This is one of the major proofs as to why we know Christianity is factually true, historically true. You know why? Because think about this, it's one thing for only the people who knew Jesus, who followed Jesus, who supported Jesus, it's, I mean, it's a proof in and of itself, but to have abandoned him and then come back. Maybe there was a conspiracy going on there, incredibly unlikely, especially when you have that many members. But think about this, it's one thing for a supporter to come back and support a cause. It's another thing for an enemy to also acknowledge a key fact that Jesus has risen from the dead, to experience the same kind of 180 radical life change that made the apostles from cowards into martyrs. Paul became a murder, went from a murderer of Christians to one of Christianity's best evangelists overnight because of one single encounter. I wonder what he saw. So Paul's preaching the message he formerly tried to destroy, and the Jews that were supposed to help him destroy that message are now trying to kill him. So they let him out of a window in a basket. He managed to get away safely, and he goes to be with the original apostles and confirm this information. We'll go into more on this when we get to Galatians. But while all this is taking place, <laughs> Paul is now a member of the Christian faith. And this is essentially the state of the church at this point. Acts 9.31 Then the churches in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in, understand the two things here, the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. There's a little rule, not just in church, but in the Christian life as well. Healthy sheep reproduce. If you want to have a living, growing relationship with God, Know first who God is, that you're not him, a healthy respect and awe, a fear of who he is. 
And also, second, that you're on good terms with him. That yes, my sins do deserve eternal separation from God forever, but because of what Jesus has done for me, the job of the Holy Spirit, remind us that Jesus has come, what he's done, and that we need it. That is our comfort in knowing, yes, who God is, holy, and I'm not worthy of him, but because of him, I've been made worthy before him. Catch that. Respect and comfort, all in equal measure. That is a growing church. The sixth event was the first missionary journey. Non-Jews start getting saved. Now remember, culturally, what were, what were non-Jews to a Jew? Just created by God to go to hell. That's all that they were according to their cultural beliefs. No, not the Bible, but their culture. The apostle Peter, of all people, was called to share the gospel with a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And despite being horribly racist towards non-Jews, there's no other way to put it, Barnabas, who was another disciple of Jesus, joins Paul, who was living at his home in Tarsus, and he brings him to Antioch, and they start sharing the gospel. And note, Antioch, this is where the term Christian was invented. It was intended as an insult. You're just a little Christ, aren't you? Trying to act like Jesus. And we took that and went, actually, yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. Thank you. And they're like, oh, man. We tried to insult him, and they just took it as a compliment. We should make more swear words next time. Well, this Christian term was invented, and this is when persecution starts to increase because under the reign of King Herod, during the reign of Emperor Claudius, James, who wasn't Jesus' biological brother, James the Apostle, the biological brother of John, he was executed, died a very brutal death. And Herod, fortunately, God didn't take that sitting down. In fact, he allowed it. Herod was struck dead by God, and Peter, who was being held in prison and awaiting execution himself to appease the Jews, more on that in a moment, escapes from prison under very bizarre circumstances. Read it on your own time if you'd like to know what, or ask. I recommend both. But he ends up going into hiding through this time of persecution. Paul and Barnabas obviously aren't in Jerusalem right now, so they continue preaching outside, and this is where the focus remains for the rest of the book, on Paul and his journeys. Now, the audience, as far as who they were ministering to, was focused on Jews to receive their Jewish Messiah, but also note the non-Jews were also listening, and they also started becoming Christians. And it was those that received the gospel, they started churches. Those that refused it, Paul and Barnabas, obeyed Jesus' orders to the letter. They took off their shoes, shook the dust off of them, and said, Had the chance to hear it? Now you're responsible for it. God has saved you so that you don't have to be judged. If you refuse to be saved, you refuse to be forgiven, then he won't. But understand that includes consequences. And they left. No violence, no coercion, no manipulation, no bribery. Nothing as far as Islam or Buddhism or any of these other expansions wasn't by military force. It was simply by offering. If you accepted it, great. If not, you'll answer to a real God who doesn't need us to enforce his law. Now, this is where we get to the seventh major event of the Acts of the Apostles, the Council of Jerusalem. Jews who were jealous of God using Paul and Barnabas to start these churches were following them around in secret, right? And whenever they established a new church, they would then go, okay, they're gone. Hey, you know that Paul guy, he was, wasn't was telling you the whole truth, right? You see, you're following the Jewish Messiah. If you don't become Jewish, you don't obey Jewish law, Jewish customs, you don't obey the law as we define it, by the way. You're not saved. If you'd like to get circumcised, we can take you out back right now. And... Eh, Paul finally caught wind of this. It's the whole book of Galatians is about this, by the way. He gets a hold of this and he confronts the Judaizers and just like every single false doctrine, if you're going to find a cult, you're going to notice this pattern. They don't care about lost people. They care about Christians that aren't a part of their group. See, they don't care if someone knows whether or not God is real, that he's revealed himself in history, what he's done for them. All they care about is having a bigger church than you. More followers, more supporters, more giving units. And so, 
when you see this kind of false doctrine being brought forth, you're going to notice that pattern. They focus on those who are already Christians, new baby Christians, and then they take the Bible that they're just about to learn and they twist it to their agenda and say, there, what do I do with this? Oh, I'll read it for you. Well, Paul got in their faces about this, and they're like, oh, well, you see, the, the original apostle sent us. You know, we, we answer directly to James, not to you, Saul. Well, Paul said, okay, let's go right now. Let's talk to the original apostles. Let's talk about this. Let's bring it right before them. So first council of Jerusalem, James, the leader of the church, Jesus' biological brother, not the James that was killed, James, the leader of the early church, who formerly didn't believe his brother was God until after his resurrection, had an encounter, I think. Actually, he did. 1 Corinthians 15 records the, uh, records rather, I can pronounce words, records the earliest Christian creed dated even by atheist scholars within months of the first Easter. So think about that. But James gathers the church together as the leader and... He hears the Judaizers out, that's what the term being used to describe them, forcing the Jewish law and saying, no, you have to become Jewish in order to be saved. Well, Paul, Barnabas, and Peter all stand up in response and say, well, here's the problem, though. God's been really legitimately and oftentimes against even what I wanted, saving people who weren't Jewish. And the Holy Spirit, he came upon him before I was even done preaching the message. Does God make mistakes? And so James, having heard all of this out, notice, then looks at God's word. Notice, he doesn't decide anything. He looks at God's word. He says, okay, we have anywhere in the Old Testament, anywhere in history up until this point, that we can say God actually offered salvation to non-Jewish people. Well, actually a lot. I mean, like, oh my goodness, Melchizedek wasn't a Jew. I mean, the Jews weren't even a thing. He was a Christian. He was a follower of the true and living God before Abraham was. Um, hmm. Oh, Uriah the the Hittite, not the Jew. Oh my. Uh, oh, Rahab, she was a Canaanite. Um, Ruth. Oh, Ruth was a Moabitess. Um, yeah, you know. Then there like a whole chapter in Isaiah talking about non-Jews receiving the Messiah, that the Gentiles will hope in him. Uh, ooh. Okay. Well, I think that settles it then. Now catch this. Paul didn't settle the matter. James didn't settle the matter. Peter didn't settle the matter. God's word settled the matter. If we don't have an authority on what we believe, we can't call ourselves anything but what we've decided we are. What we've made up, rather, is what I mean. Because think about this. The three non-negotiables. Try and keep it as low as possible as far as what makes or breaks a Christian. Is God, well, first off, real, but is God as he's revealed himself in history as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus obviously being God, is the Bible his word? and is salvation by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians chapter 2, right? Is God is salvation through God's mercy or what you do for him? Well, if you say, well, I believe that God is who he's revealed himself in nature and in history, and I believe the Bible is God's word, but I believe that you have to earn your salvation like the Mormons. Well, let's look at the Bible then. How do you explain this passage? How do you explain God's nature? Is this always in priority? How do you explain him reaching out to these people who didn't deserve him at all? Oh, well, they, they did good things, <laughs> according to the word. Oh, well, I don't believe the Bible is God's word. I believe who God is. I believe salvation's by grace, but I don't believe the Bible is God's word. It's full of errors and contradictions. I can't show you any, but um, where did you read that? How God's revealed himself, his nature. How do you know that salvation's by grace? Would that just mean that's your opinion about God? Oh, I, I don't, I believe that salvation's by grace through faith. I believe the Bible's true. I just don't believe in the Trinity. Oh, that nonsense. I don't understand it. Well, first off, you don't have to understand everyone completely to have a relationship with them. Try 
as a guy having a relationship with a woman or vice versa. You'll never understand that. Doesn't mean you can't love them. Also understand, shouldn't God be more complicated than his creation? Just a thought. Thirdly, where did we figure out that term Trinity? How did we find out that is how God has revealed himself? You don't believe the Bible then, do you? Well, that's the problem. If God's word isn't our authority. If it's a church leader or a church cause or our own emotions, we can't call ourselves Christians because we're basing ourselves not on following what God said, but what we think. And I'm sorry, but God's not going to settle for less than the truth as far as a relationship with him. We need to define it on those terms. Now note, if you didn't know that up until this point, you have a choice now. But also understand, there needs to be an authority that we base truth on, or it's just an opinion. It needs to be objective, not subjective. I'm not the subject, this is the object. Got it? I know that's not how it works, but you get the point. So, God's word settled it. Non-Jews became the focus of Paul and Barnabas' ministry, and the original remaining apostles would go on to continue preaching to the Jews who didn't yet know their Messiah. Now, this is where we get to the final major cluster of events, the final events mainly, just the missionary journeys leading up to Paul's appeal to Caesar, which is what leads us into the epistles, the books of the Bible that we'll be reading after this. Paul's appeal to Caesar was the big one. So note, Paul and Barnabas, missionary team extraordinaire, reaching out to the non-Jews. Well, John Mark, yes, that John Mark, who was a relative of Barnabas, they got into a squabble over him. I'll explain the details later, but that essentially split them up. Paul took a guy named Silas. They headed to Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, preached to the Jews and Christians, hopefully Christians, but the people who didn't know Jesus yet in Greece and in Asia. And Barnabas and John went to be with Peter, and that's where the first gospel was written. Now... The, at this time, Paul's missionary journey, his second missionary journey, Paul and Silas, they head up into Turkey and through a very amusing set of circumstances, God definitely saw them through. The Philippian, yes, the Philippians, the Philippian church was founded. No shortage of opposition, but definitely a good opportunity. Second, the Thessalonian church was also founded, but Paul could only stay for a few weeks because of the people there that were trying to kill him, the Jews that were opposing the message of Christ. So he had to head then south to Berea, and I mentioned this at the beginning of the study, this region in Greece that um, when Paul and Silas were sharing the gospel with them, telling them this happened in history, they said, let's check it out. Full thumbs up. Then after Berea, the guys who wanted to kill Paul followed him down there and so they said look Paul why don't you go down to Athens let these guys cool off a little bit then you can come up so Paul's supposed to be having downtime in Athens but instead he goes to the Aragopagus I don't think that's how you pronounce that but nonetheless Aragopagus I don't know it's it's the open square where they had all of the public meetings, conversations, lectures. It's where they had all the altars to their gods. And Paul's looking around and says, the altar to the unknown God. It's referencing the God of the Bible. And they had access to the Septuagint at this time. That was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, by the way. And so he looks at that and he says, hey, I want to tell you guys about this God. And the Greeks, they're all over that. It's like, great, let's talk about a new God. They had the God of Calmuel do last week. Let's, let's get something neat. And so Paul goes on and starts from Genesis, from creation, that God requires all men to answer to him, and essentially just lays out the gospel for him in terms they would understand. Because remember, the Greeks, no access to the Old Testament beyond the Septuagint. He just assumes that they don't know it. And they hear him out, some disbelieve, some want to hear more. But you, you can't keep Paul down. He's just sharing the gospel wherever he goes. Then after that, he moves on to Turkey in Asia Minor, where the church in Corinth, the Corinthians, were founded. And there he stays for a very long time. Men and women are also raised up during this time, like Apollos, who was a preacher. There was Priscilla and Aquila, who were a husband and wife that owned a tent-making industry, and they hired Paul to work for them so that he could make money and wouldn't have to charge for sharing the gospel. And that's also likewise where he met Timothy on this way. 
No, not Timothy. That'll be a moment where he met Luke. And that's where the transition shifts from him reporting they, they, they. Then he says we in recording the account. So Luke enters in. Then he moves on to the, well, he moves on to Ephesus where the Ephesian church is then founded. And this is actually hilarious. The uh, people see Paul's miracles and hear his messages and the Jews there that don't believe in Jesus, but they're like, yeah, it's pretty impressive. And so they find this demonically possessed man and they said, we cast you out in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Right, trying to get the benefits of a relationship with God without knowing him. The demon looks at them and says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? And I don't know what happened, but they ran out of the building beaten up and stripped naked. So might take a hint at that. Have a relationship with God before you start acting like it. And... <laughs> Likewise, another SJW riot takes place in Ephesus when they dare to stand in the way of their porn collections. And so Paul has to leave. But on his way back, he finds out also he wants to take a boat back to Syria, but there's assassins waiting for him. More Jews that are trying to kill him. And so he says, I'll just walk back. And on his way back, he runs into his protege, Timothy, of which the letters to Timothy were written. He returns to Jerusalem, finally making his way home, and he makes every effort not to cause any trouble. Unfortunately, as is the case, the trouble then ends up finding him. The people that he was formerly a student with, just as passionate as he was, you'd imagine, and his former friends uh, make up this bogus story about he was hanging out with a non-Jew. He brought a non-Jew into, into the Jewish temple. He's violated the temple, and they stir up this riot on this lie, and they try to beat Paul to death. The Roman guards see this, and they don't know what's going on. They just save the guy getting pummeled to death. And Paul, Christian as he is, he says, hey, can I, can I, pre can I say something to them? And he shares the gospel with the people who are just trying to murder him. And he's like, hey, I know where you guys are coming from. I wanted to kill Christians too, but I met Jesus. And Jesus, he's, he's revealed himself as the Messiah, God in his glory. I wanted to kill him. I was just like you. But, but now God has called all men to repentance. He's revealed himself to mankind. And they're all riveted. They're like, oh my gosh, we know that. Paul. We know you, Paul. You wouldn't make this up. And he says, and now he's called us to preach to the Gentiles. And the moment they say, God doesn't love white people. Let's kill him. And the Roman soldiers, Paul said this all in Hebrew, so they didn't understand what's happening. They just said, what did he say? And so the guards get him under lock and key for his own safety, if anything else. It's kind of like the canary in the cage. Are you, aren't you restricted? And he says, no, it keeps the cat out. Well, they bring him before court. They don't know what's going on, but the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, the judge that sentenced Jesus to death, they're like, hey, we got to talk to this Paul formal Saul of Tarsus. Yeah, that's the one. He was one of our ilk. Let's talk to him. And the Romans are like, sure, fine. Just don't kill him or anything. And so they bring Paul up in chains to interrogate him. It's like, what are you preaching this nonsense about God loving non-Jewish people? And, <laughs> and Paul, knowing, remember, Pharisees and Sadducees made up the Sanhedrin group. The Pharisees were the spiritual ones. They believed in the resurrection, whole Old Testament memorized, all the moral code. The Sadducees were the secularists. They were the religious scholars, but kind of the Bart Ehrmans of their day. They didn't believe in anything, and they wouldn't believe in anything. They just kind of did it because it was popular. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees are both interviewing him, and Paul knows these guys, right? He, he was one of the Pharisees, so he's like, oh, this is going to be fun. I know how to stir up politics. Uh, just kind of throwing blood into a shark tank, you know, and he's like, oh, I was only arrested because of my preaching on the resurrection from the dead. Well, the Pharisees are like, oh, well, this guy couldn't be all that bad. I mean, he's preaching the resurrection from the dead. And the Sadducees turn and say like, what do you mean he shouldn't be arrested? It's believing in something so stupid as a resurrection from the dead. It's like, well, you're stupid. Your mom's stupid. And they, they're just all squabbling. And the Roman soldiers are like, I don't get this country. <laughs> and so they take Paul back and the Pharisees try to kill Paul because that's how they solve all their problems. The commander of the... <laughs> The commander of the Roman garrison has Paul given this military escort and they take him off to Caesarea. That was the Roman 
bastion of this area of the world. And that way he'd be safe. And the guy who was in charge of that region, taken over for Pilate as well as several other people before him, named Felix, he, like Herod before him, says, yeah, I can score some political points with these Jews if I keep Paul in prison. That way he's not sharing the gospel and no one gets upset. So with this kind of PC nonsense, Paul's like, I see what's going on here. I'm a Roman citizen born in Tarsus, but I am, no, not Tarsus, anyway, born in a Roman province, right? I have the right to appeal my case to, like in America, the Supreme Court. I appeal my case before Emperor Nero, the emperor ruling at that time. By the way, this is before he went nuts. And <laughs> Felix is like, there's not anything I can do. You're, you're going to Caesar. But the problem was he was arrested on nothing. And he's been in prison for years. So he gets his friend Agrippa and he's like, hey, I got a problem here. Caesar has to see this guy for a crime and to get his fair trial in court, but there isn't any crime. And I'm gonna get in trouble, like big trouble, if the one job I was supposed to do isn't being done. A guy's coming before him and saying, what were you arrested for? Nothing, I was just held in prison for five years. Well, the emperor's eyes are going to go to him, right? So he's like, can you help me like make up some charges? So Agrippa comes before Paul and he tries to like interrogate him, make him say something stupid. But Paul, no matter where he's at, whether it's the politicians or the kings or the Roman guards that he's strapped to 24-7, he's sharing the gospel with everybody. Now, Felix, he's like, you're crazy. Agrippa, he was so convinced what Paul was saying was true, but didn't accept it. He was shaking, just wanting to maintain his lifestyle. And he's like, Paul, I'll, I'll hear this later. Stop, stop. <laughs> they get him on a boat and they take him to Rome and they managed to get just south of Italy, which was the island of Malta. And they end up shipwrecked because of one of the storms that tends to brew in the center Mediterranean. Well, Paul and the rest of the people on the ship survive the shipwreck and they arrive in Malta. Miracles before, during, and after that wreck continue to drop major hints towards everything that Paul is saying to these Romans that have now survived, as well as the prisoners who are now going to be scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And Paul's sharing the gospel with all these people. The Holy Spirit is saving all these guys. And when he finally arrives in Rome, he's awaiting his first trial before Caesar in prison. And he, at this time, begins writing the letters that we're going to be reading about as far as the next books of the Bible are concerned. And that is where the Acts of the Apostles closes. It doesn't end, but it caps off as far as, and God's going to continue working for the next 2,000 plus years. So thank you for your time and listening to the study. If you have any sincere questions, ask them. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, do so. But most importantly, you know, someone who perhaps could use this starting point for reading the book of Acts in their own time, please share it with anyone you feel would be blessed by it. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. Remember that Jesus loves you and the witness that he's given us in history to know that our faith isn't based on feelings, but facts. Facts of history, facts of morality, and facts. And most importantly, facts of his personal desire for a relationship with you. That's a reality I would love to take with me into eternity.